This is a short revision video on the productivity and efficiency section of the markets and market failure part of economics AS level with AQA. Now that was a mouthful. Specialisation and the division of labour. Specialisation is the production of a limited range of goods by an individual factor of production, a firm or a country. For this to work there has to be a means of exchange. A means of exchange means that if I produce one thing and someone else produces something else, we can swap them over in exchange for each other. We need this to happen because, for example, if I produce books and you produce food, I can't live without food and you're going to get pretty bored without books, so we need to be able to swap our stuff so we've each got a whole range of goods and services. When it's in terms of specialisation with countries, we need a whole system of trade in place so that we can all trade our goods and services so we get a great range and enjoy a fabulous life. The division of labour is when you break down production into a sequence of tasks and each worker is assigned to a particular task. For example, if we're producing a bucket, we would have lots of different workers and one worker would melt the metal and put it into shape, the next worker might paint it, the next one might add a handle and so on and so forth. Doing it this way is a lot quicker than having one worker do the whole lot because it means that workers become particularly focused on their area of the task and the whole process is much quicker, faster, cheaper. So that saves money and time. There are loads of benefits of division of labour which is why so many companies have taken it on board and now use it. One of them is increased aptitude. Because the workers are doing the same thing over and over and over, they get better and better at it, meaning that not only do they do it faster, but they also do it to a higher quality. So the work they do is of a higher quality, the goods they produce are of a higher quality, which means that the firm gets a better reputation and can sell it for more, get more profit, that sort of thing. Division of labour saves so much time. One reason for this is because workers can stay in one place, they can stay at one station, rather than having to move from machine to machine to get stuff done. I suppose a drawback of this might be that they get less exercise and put on weight and stuff, but that's not important in the whole like world of the firm, unless they die. Which probably isn't too important to the firm anyway. Another reason why time is saved is because workers only have to be trained in specific areas, so rather than having to be trained in every single aspect of the production process, if they're only focusing on one part of the production process, you only have to train them in that area, which saves a lot of time and money for the company. Division of labour also plays to someone's natural strengths. So, for example, if I'm quite small, I'm a girl, I'm not the strongest, I've got no arms, like my arm on my muscle doesn't exist. So if you put me in charge of some lifting task, it would be so pointless, But if, we, if, if that was part of the process. But if we, you divide the labour up and you give me a job where I'm painting, I mean, I can't paint either, but say I was a really good painter, it would mean you'd be playing to my strengths, so you get a better quality product, probably get it faster if I was good at painting. It also means that the people themselves can focus on what they themselves are best at, which is good for them, it's probably happier for them, they have a nicer working environment which suits them. Capital equipment is also a benefit, not the capital equipment itself, the fact that the firm can now use it in a more efficient manner. Because the firm's producing more due to division of labour, it means it's more worthwhile for the firm to buy equipment, it can also afford the equipment because it's selling more, so it buys capital equipment which increases its productivity and that means that costs fall even further, so average costs just plummet, which is really good for a firm that wants to make profits, which are basically all firms. Production and productivity, it's really important not to get these two mixed up, oh dear, just bang my keyboard, like a lot of people do. Now production is the process which converts factor inputs into outputs, and you might also be considered to be the total output of goods and services within the market. And then productivity is output per factor of production per period of time. And you get lots of different types of factor productivity. So, I mean, you get pretty much all the factors of production except for enterprise. So, land, labour, and capital. The big ones, labour productivity, which is output per worker per period of time. But in general, it's total output per time period divided by number of units of factor. And the total factor productivity is total output divided by total input. There are lots of advantages to a firm of increasing their productivity. One of them is lower average costs. This is because the workers are making more in the same period of time. And because the wages of the workers is a fixed cost, the cost per unit being produced is lower. Because if you share the cost over all the increased number of units being produced, it's less than, say, there were fewer being produced when productivity was lower. 
This then leads on to improved competitiveness in the international market because increased productivity means lower unit costs and that means that a firm is more competitive in the international market because it compete more with firms in, for example, firms in other countries who have slightly higher costs and prices due to their lower productivity. So you can compete better and do better in the international market, which is quite a hard thing to do. Obviously, higher profits also follow through from that because lower average costs mean higher profits, especially when you're selling on the international market, you can compete. There is such a great market there out there. If you can reach it with your low prices, profits, you're going to be rolling in the dough, mate. You also get higher real wages because the firms are making more, they're able and more willing to pay their workers more. And obviously if people have more, this leads to a positive multiplier effect leading to increased employment and demand and increased employment and demand. There's a video on that that I made ages ago if you want to watch it to find out more. There is also growth for the economy, especially for the reasons that I've just outlined, because that leads to the reflation of an economy, but also an outward shift of the production possibility boundary because the firms throughout the market are able to make more with the same resources. However, this could be bad. If productivity growth is greater than demand growth, there will be unemployment because more will be produced than is needed, so firms are going to have to knock some people off so that they produce just the right amount and reach the equilibrium. Productive efficiency. This occurs when the firm's output is produced at minimum average total costs and that is shown on that diagram there. We'll come to that diagram later and talk about economies of scale and diseconomies of scale. But for now, all you need to know is that productive efficiency is at Q1, which means that the producers are minimising their wastage of resources used in the production process. So they're producing at the lowest possible average cost per unit. Productive efficiency also occurs at any point on the production possibility boundary because the whole country or the firm or whatever is using all of its resources to the maximum extent it can. It could change what it's putting them into, but it can't do any more with them. It's using them all to their total, total level. I mean, it's almost impossible to get to this level because of unemployment and stuff like that. But if it was at that level on the production possibility boundary, then there would be productive efficiency. Moving on now to costs of production. You can calculate total costs by adding fixed costs to variable costs. Fixed costs are costs of production that don't vary as output changes, such as rent, insurance charges, salaried staff costs, marketing costs, costs of new capital equipment, and deprecation of the value in capital equipment, they don't change because you need them whether you're producing 10 units a week or 50 units a week. It stays the same for this particular firm, obviously, because different firms will have different fixed costs. Variable costs change depending on the amount of stuff you're making. So that's stuff like raw materials, consumables and labour that isn't on a permanent contract. For example, if I'm making wooden cars and I was making 50 a week, my cost of the wood might be £50, but if I was only making 20 a week, the cost of the wood might only be £20. So it's a variable cost because it changes depending on the amount that I produce. I'm not really sure what this section is doing, but it's just a random slide on competition. And competition occurs when there are a large number of buyers and sellers in a market, and this leads to productive efficiency and consumer sovereignty. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that one. Productive efficiency occurs because less for efficient firms can't compete because their prices are too high, which means they lose market share, they sort of get dwindled down and they get kicked out of the market. So it means that if there's competition, everyone's producing to their top efficiency level because that's the only thing you can do if you want to stay in the market. And obviously this is good for the general economy and the environment and stuff because you wouldn't want there to be a firm that's being really inefficient. You can't even be inefficient, you have to be inefficient, because inefficient isn't a word. And then consumer sovereignty occurs because firms produce what the consumers want. If there's lots and lots of firms in the market, they'll all be trying to get exactly what the consumers want, so they can sell to them and get the demand from the consumers for their product, otherwise they're going to lose market share, get kicked out of the market. However, there are some issues of competition, especially when there are monopolies, because this means that smaller firms simply can't compete, they get kicked out of the market, that leads to job loss, wasted resources, stuff like that. Also, large firms like monopolies invest their profit into research, which pushes firms out further because these big firms have got research into greater productivity, so they can increase their productivity, so have lower average costs, whilst these smaller firms, they can't research into these things, they can't research into what the consumer wants, so they get kicked out. Tragic. 
Moving back to this diagram, if you look at this diagram, along the bottom it's output and along the side it's the cost of production. So, when we're increasing output at the start, we get economies of scale because we're producing more, and we'll come on to different economies of scale in a second, but you're producing more and scale of production is increasing, so that's a reduction in average total costs for reasons we're going to come on to later. So that's why it goes downwards. Then we hit our productive efficiency there at Q1, and then after that the increase of production actually causes average total costs to rise for reasons we're going to come to later. Though in real life it's not quite as dramatic as on that diagram. Internal economies of scale result from the growth of the firm itself. So it would be just one firm. So say I ran a cheese shop and then suddenly I grew and I benefited from this and my average costs fell. That would be an internal economy of scale. Whereas an external economy of scale, which we'll come on to in a second, is when the whole cheese shop industry boomed. And we'll come on to that in more detail later. So there are five main types of economies of scale. So there's technical, marketing, managerial, financial and network. Technical is because larger businesses can afford to invest in capital machinery. This means that their productivity increases, which causes average costs to fall. There's also the law of increased dimensions. So, for example, a building that's got double the height has got more than double the capacity because it gets much bigger. If you imagine a cube and then you double the height of the cube, it increases its capacity by more than double that. If that makes any sense, it's really hard to explain you really don't need to know it. Mainly because I don't. And larger firms can also afford to have division of labour and stuff like that because they can afford to pay more workers. And then they can also get better staff. Marketing. Large firms can spread their advertising budget over a large output. So they, they can afford to spend more and because they're bigger they can put it over a greater area. So say I was a local firm and I haven't got that much money, I can only advertise in my local area, whereas a big firm that sells lo nationally, they can afford to put uh, advertising everywhere, more people see it, they can afford to have it on TVs, more people watch TV than listen to the local radio, stuff like that. Plus, at a certain level, you can't increase the advertising any more properly. So say I was a small firm selling nationally, and I've got a TV advert, that's all my outputs being advertised there, but a larger firm can have much greater output and still pay just the same for one TV advert. Then we come to managerial economies of scale. Ooh, exciting. Large firms can justify having managers because they can say, look, we've got lots of staff, so we really ought to get a manager in. And managers raise productivity. I mean, managers have got such a diverse range of jobs. They boost team morale, keep everyone in check, stuff like that. Financial economies of scale occur because banks see a big, big firm, they say, look, that big firm is more reliable, so we can give them a better rate of interest. So when a large firm borrows money to invest, it only has to pay a smaller amount back, whereas if a small, fickle firm invests, they have to pay a much higher rate of interest, which isn't really so good for it. And finally, network. Firms that are in widely used networks and services have more potential for economies of scale. So certain firms have got a much greater potential for economies of scale than other firms which have a really small clientele. External economies of scale result from the growth of the entire industry. So say I was working on a, I was going to say a pot farm, but that doesn't sound very good, a plant pot factory, and suddenly the plant pot industry boomed. I would benefit from a whole lot of things due to the growth of the entire industry, such as better transport networks, there might be better systems put in place for the transportation of pot plants, or was it plant pots, I can't even remember what I was selling now. But you might get ships and stuff that were specially designed to carry plant pots, simply because the whole um, industry was growing, that sort of thing. There will be increased research into what makes a good plant pot and then if you've got lots of firms in the industry they can all use the research that's been done by bigger firms. And then finally the relocation of support businesses to manufacturing centre. So if industry grows you might move the whole support business because the whole support business, a support business is a business that helps your business. So if I'm making plant pots it might be the clay clay producers and if they're doing well as well because if you're doing well they'll do well they might be able to afford to move to a manufacturing center which means their cost of production will fall which means that your cost of production will fall because they're if your the support business is producing at a lower cost they'll probably sell at a slightly lower price meaning that your total costs are going to fall Diseconomies of scale there are three main types the three c's control coordination and cooperation 
This reminds me of that thing in Harry Potter. The three Ds for apparition, destination, determination, and deliberation. I think I read too much Harry Potter. Anyway, control in a business is harder when you've got a bigger business, because it's hard to monitor productivity and quality. It's also quite expensive to do that. So, for example, in a small team, you can tell exactly what Jeff is doing, so you can make sure he's doing the right thing, whereas if you've got a massive factory, lots and lots of factories all over the country, Jeff is just one small worker, you've got no idea what he's doing. He could be there just having a fag. So, you know, it's much harder to control these things when you've got a much bigger organisation. Coordination. It's really hard to coordinate a big business. So you have to achieve efficient flows of information, and that is quite expensive to do. So say you've got a factory in Belarus and a factory in Belgium, it's really hard to get the information from one to the other efficiently. So that's quite an expensive thing to do. Make sure you've got a secure internet connection, emails, that sort of thing. Also, bigger companies tend to have more supply contracts, and that's quite an expensive thing to handle. And finally, cooperation from the workers. If we remember Jeff, he was just one small worker. He probably felt really alienated, felt like he wasn't a true part of the business. So he might not work as hard, reduce productivity. You know, Jeff, he's just ruining your business. Whereas if you were in a small team, Jeff might really feel like he was an integral part of the business and work really hard and produce much faster, so higher productivity. So this is why cooperation is an issue in larger businesses. Luckily, there are things we can do to make sure people like Jeff don't ruin our business. One of them is human resource management, which means staff training and support. So we might get a manager or someone that supports Jeff on his journey, make sure he feels like an integral part of the team, and that means his productivity will get better as well. We can also have staff training to make them understand their importance of the role in their team. Then we have performance-related pay, which is an incentive for each individual worker, such as Jeff, to have work hard as they can, have the maximum productivity. So that's, I mean, there are issues with performance related pay, don't get me wrong, but they can have a really good positive impact on increasing productivity. And finally, outsourcing. If we have a massive firm, we can outsource some of our stuff. So we might have got a call center, and instead of us running it, we can outsource it to a much bigger company that just deals with call centers, and it will be a specialist one, and that will have much better control, so that will, cancel the effects of the monitoring control issue of the this economy of scale. I hope that has helped you. If there's anything you need, then just tell me, comment below, and I hope you have a lovely day. Good luck in the exam. Bye.